Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. On today's video, well, I got a box of stuff here. We're gonna take a look at it. And this time, unlike last time, I'm gonna do it here on this bench, not over there. That way we have the top-down camera for some actual close-up footage of some of the things in here. There's just a whole bunch of cards and things in here. So uh, I think I'm gonna need community help to try to figure out what some of this stuff is, because it's uh, that's pretty interesting, to be honest. There we go. Oh, I'm having an adult beverage here, so I'll just move that off to the side. And uh, I'm gonna put this cutting mat down to try to make the camera uh, expose things a little bit better. This top-down camera really struggles with uh, the light mat sometimes. All right, so the first card is this one. Let's zoom in on this thing. It's a real beauty. <laughs> There's actually a whole bunch of cards in here. And um, obviously, if I zoom back out again, these cards obviously come from some type of a computer system like that had a backplane. And unfortunately, there's just no information that I can see on these cards, although I haven't really taken a look or doing that together to help identify what these are. All right, well, since I can't really see the chip markings, I'm gonna use my, uh, my goggles here. All right, so clearly we were looking at a RAM card of some kind, right? All righty, take a look at that. So what do we have here? 8202 Intel, very scratched up package. Now these chips, which look like RAM chips, are completely unmarked. 106966-02. So does anyone recognize what that part number is? Obviously this is like an OEM part number for some manufacturer, but who exactly? I'm gonna use this to point here. So this here is a 64K DRAM, 4864, these ones which I'm assuming, uh, let's see how many gold chips there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight gold chips, and then these chips on the end. So this must be parity, right? So I guess that kind of tells us that these are 64K DRAMs. And the thing is, I see 1981 date codes on here. This much memory, this is 256K in 1981. I think that's kind of expensive. That's going to be a <laughs> that'll be a very expensive system. But I suppose if you're using these gold packages, well, there you go. Alrighty, well, let's try to look at markings on here. So <laughs> Intel made in the USA. Now remember, Intel's main campus is here in Oregon, in Portland. So so perhaps this stuff belonged to an ex engineer of Intel or or something. That's all I can really think of for a board like this. What other markings do we see? Looks like we have a start address right here with a jumper. It allows you to pick where this RAM exists. We definitely have some bodge wires that are making their way down the board. And right here on the end, PWA143156. Obviously some type of part number, I guess, and a serial number, 12001. That's relatively high if this were something that we're kind of bespoke or something like that. And looking at the back, what does this say here? Oh, scrap, okay. So <laughs> I guess someone decided at some point that this board wasn't worth even keeping. We got some bodge wires here. They're a little hard to see because of the blue PCB, which looks really nice. And then obviously I, I didn't really talk about this, but we have two connectors, one that has a smaller pin pitch, almost like ISA bus or something and then this larger, older pin pitch here. So yeah, there we go, that's the first board. It's a RAM board. What we're gonna try to figure out is there's gonna be more just like this. What type of system did this come out of? So, cause here is the next one here. I'm gonna need to make a little stack of boards on the side there. So this, okay, um, what do we think this is? Does it say anything on here? It still says Intel right down here in the corner. So that's something. We have a couple 2732 EEPROMs and I like they put a little paint over the window just to keep them from getting erased. An 8253 right there. What is this large 40 pin dip package? Zoom in on that. 8089. <laughs> What exactly is an 8089? I'm gonna have to go look that up. 
It says the 8089 is an input-output coprocessor for the 8086 and 8088 central processor. So maybe this thing on one of these other boards has an 8088 or an 8086. I like right here it says, because IBM didn't use it in the IBM PC, it was not a well-known chip, was used in the Apricot PC and Intel's multibus. Wait, is this multibus? Okay, I thought maybe um, this ISBC 215 was something to do with this computer we're looking at right here. So I just had to click on multibus. I was curious. The cards here don't look anything like the ones we're looking at. Anyhow, uh, back to the card. Winchester Disk Controller. So that's interesting because that Wikipedia article says that they use that 8089 on their disk controller card. This one doesn't look anything like the one we were looking at. So uh, that looks like a 50 pin connector. I don't think it's gonna be SCSI. This is gonna be probably interfacing to the old Western Digital 1000 series, which uses like an 8-bit type CPU data bus type of interface. And then this one over here looks kind of like a 40 pin or something. This looks like 40th week of 1980 on that IC. These Intel chips here, oh, 214s. Okay, so those are SRAMs right there. 42nd week of 1981 for these ICs. So anyhow, okay, well, this controller card. Oh, incidentally, yeah, look at that. We have dip switches here and here. We have a couple programmable array logic ICs. Oh, no, they're not. I'm sorry, I just see that logo and I automatically assume it's a PAL. That's just a 74 LS244. Well, let's take a look at the back. Anything special on here other than uh, something was stamped right here, probably that scrap marking. What do we have down here in the corner here? Looks like just the part number again. Yeah, okay. So we have a disc controller card and a RAM card. And I'll see what's what next. What would be next here? This looks like, I don't know what this one is. Um, it's pretty bent is what this one is. <laughs> Floppy disk interface, double density, Intel 1976. There's a bodge wire that's running up here along to there. Oh, there's a whole bunch of bodge wires on this thing. We've got a ROM chip. This, I uh, can't quite make out the markings. It's Intel chip here. Some type of a chip. There's a little potentiometer right there. Now, odd is this interface connector at the top here. You would think of a floppy disk controller would have just normal floppy drive interfaces, but I'm thinking that this probably is an add-on board to an existing single-density floppy disk controller, and basically you must have had some type of ribbon cable that went here that would attach it to the other board. That's the only thing I'm thinking. This definitely looks like some analog stuff up here, and on the back... We also have that scrap marking Intel Corporation in Oregon. So yeah, these came from Intel themselves. But like I said, maybe they belonged to an Intel engineer who had this stuff, uh, picked it up when it was thrown out as scrap, brought it home, and then ended up, it ended up with me. Here's the next board. I mean, what could this be? Is this another hard drive controller? This really screams of the original sugar type hard drive interface instead of the st506 which was a 34 pin and then a little extra connector for the the data the mfm or the actual read write data the original sugar drives used 50 pin connectors but they used an edge connector like this and then there still was this little connector here do i see anything about this being like a hard drive controller or something not really uh, let's see here. Well, we're missing the ROMs, I guess. Someone pillaged that stuff. We got SRAMs here, a whole lot of ceramic SRAMs. Those would have been pretty expensive. Obviously, the, I think like these would have been ROM chips. Got some Intel chips here. We have a 8251 and 8253. We have a missing IC here that could have been like a microcontroller or something that ran this thing. This actually has an 8086 on here. I mean, maybe this is not a hard drive controller and maybe this is a, the CPU, like the main CPU card. It just seems unusual that it has these large connectors up here. But yeah, this, this well, may be the CPU card itself because there it is, 8086. And I'm wondering if um, maybe this was a math coprocessor right here. I don't know. 
But we do have some more missing ICs here. There were these uh, blue connectors on here, which we saw on one of the other boards as, as well. And just a bunch of stuff. And the date codes, look at that, 8125, 8134. So late in 1981. Look at all these jumpers here. No other markings that I could see, except, of course, down here. It says Intel right there. And we have a crystal oscillator there of... I don't know, 24 megahertz, I guess. Hmm. And this one up here, 9.8304. I don't really recognize that ratio. It's not something that was used in the PC architecture. And these 2114s here, oh no, 2118s. I don't even know what these are. I'm gonna have to go look that up. I'm familiar with the 2114. Let's check out what 2118 is. I'm assuming it's 512 bytes, but maybe by eight instead of by four bits. All right, it appears it's some type of a DRAM chip. There it is, 16K by one DRAM. So that means we are looking at 32K of RAM right here. And of course, since it's an Intel 8086, 16 bits means you need to have 16 chips for that purpose. Let's just check out the back. It says scrap again on there. Not really seeing anything else. Let's try to read this notice here. Notice of included license. This product may be used with software, which is subject to a license, which Intel Corporation, uh, with Intel Corporation, with the purposes of license. Uh, yeah, okay, well, I don't know. What kind of license is it talking about? Who knows? Um, don't see a lot of bodges on this CPU board, but it is certainly concerning that we are missing a bunch of chips. You know, out of these ones, and this, and these. Oh, and these ones up at the top. See, I don't know. That means, uh, well, I'm not even sure how it would be possible to get this thing working again, considering the boards are bodged up and say scrap and stuff on them. All right, we have another board here. This one has that same kind of expansion connector that we saw on the floppy drive. And actually take a look right here. Floppy disk controller channel. It says Intel again, lots of Intel ICs. What's this say? Past, hot, cold, 1982. So some type of testing, I suppose. Can we even tell what kind of chip this is? I cannot read these markings. Can't quite make that out. Gold paint <laughs> up on the corners here. Interesting. And if we flip this over, we have that same scrap marking, but otherwise this board's in good shape other than the odd gold paint in the corners. Floppy drive channel. This just doesn't seem like a disk controller to me. You normally would have like a disk controller IC, but maybe these are controllers that were designed before those controller ICs came out. So you had to kind of do it all yourself. Okay, we have another board. Well, this one, um, this one here says Winchester disk controller. So let's grab the other one, which is, where is it? Is it this one? There it is, I think. Nope. All right, it's this one. It's the one we were looking at before. So these look the same other than the ROMs have been stolen off this lower one. Uh, it's in kind of rough shape as well. Got some interesting bodging going on right there. And oh, I just noticed it says eight inch Winchester disc controller. Does the other one say that as well? It does not. It just says Winchester disc controller. Alrighty, anyways, um, yeah, fascinating. Okay, well, we have another board that's uh, kind of the same as the other one. And I think this had what this was, that's right. It was the 8089. It was on these, both of these things have the 8089. Also, I'm just realizing now is that there is no, there's nothing actually connected to this edge connector right here. It's almost simply a placeholder. And um, everything on this card goes across the larger, the larger edge connector. And you know what? That is actually it. There are no further cards that look like that. Now we're getting onto stuff that looks different, uh, like this thing. Intermittent track on board associated with CRT keyboard circuitry. Flexing board will cause it to work. Otherwise, it locks up with C CRT keyboard LED on. And I don't know what those numbers mean. I mean, looking at this thing, it kind of looks like a single board computer of some type. 
see what I can see here. So this package up in the corner is an 8085, 8255. Pretty sure that's a serial controller port, right? Am I, am I mistaken on that? This one looks like an 8272, another Intel part. Another 8255 up here in this corner. Obviously we have expansion headers there. And then in the middle of the board, there's another 8085. So this thing has two 8085s. There's a ROM chip here, there, missing ROM chip there. And then right here is an 8202. Then there's this little um, add-on board that is stuck on here. And it says defective right there. This little board here seems to plug into a couple sockets or three sockets on the board. And it has some standoffs. Intel branding right there. Turning it around, we have some status LEDs. So that's a option, program, power, base processor, CRT keyboard. I don't think there's any more LEDs under there. Nope, there aren't. There's just a socket that the uh, this little board plugs into. So that's the LED that it was complaining stays on unless you flex the board. So there's some kind of a bad <laughs> trace on here. Those can be really hard to troubleshoot. And obviously Intel was not interested in troubleshooting this board. We've got a potentiometer of some kind right here off the board. And then we have these multi-pin connectors. These are 25s and this has more pins than that. Now looking down here, these chips, there's eight of them, which sort of implies that that is DRAM. Take a look, it's those same kind of part numbers like we saw in those gold packages earlier. 106, can't quite read the rest of it. Oh, there we go, 106966. Oh, same part number as those gold packages. So we can kind of make the assumption from 1981, 39th week, that these are 64K DRAMs. So my hunch on this board is that this is some kind of a terminal board, like a terminal emulator that connects up to a monitor and keyboard, I guess. I don't exactly know where. There's a header right here, or you know, could be these, these connectors. There's a header right there as well. So monitor and keyboard are connected to this thing. Oh, and of course, these two right here. And it has lots of serial ports and some RAM. And so maybe it's a computer, a single board computer of some kind. I, I just don't know. And on the back, it's Bodge City. Look at all these Bodge wires here. Lots of Bodge wires. Uh, we have the scrap thing there. I can't quite mean. I think this is scrap again. Tons and tons of bodge wires, a big bundle of them here. Pretty cool, but that would make troubleshooting this stuff really difficult. So hopefully someone looks at this and they recognize it, along with those other boards we looked at, and um, we can kind of get some information on this stuff. There's a bunch more coming up that are, that are kind of like this as well. I'm just uh, grabbed a few of the smaller boards. So here is one of them. Let's zoom in on this, turn this around. So we got 8292, 8291, what is this? 8293, 8293, pin header that's unpopulated. It does say Intel on there, 488 Intel GPIB interface. I don't know. Edge connector, clock crystal, and on the back, let's look at the back here. This is just taped on red paint. Maybe this is some way that they mark stuff as scrap. Does seem to say, or you know, similar markings as scrap, but I guess this red paint, I don't know. And let's look at this little tag here. Intel, second assembly, touch up, wire wrap, 34. Maybe someone watching worked at Intel and they might recognize what this means, and what this board is. Alrighty, moving on, we have another board here and this has a 40 pin dip that would have plugged in to a board. Now the pins are all bent up, unfortunately. It does say scrap on it as well, but there we go. We have space for like maybe presumably you take the processor out, put another one on here. It maybe gives you a math code processor or something like that. And uh, zoom in a little bit. Lots of ICs. I don't know. I couldn't figure out what this might be other than this is some type of a coprocessor board. PWA 144179-001 and it says Intel Corp and the date's there, 1981 again, 48th week, stuff like that. And we got SRAM, I just noticed there, SRAM and SRAM. And then we have another similar board, but different. <laughs> uh, here it is, look at this, ISBC 308 Intel Corp 
Um, similar to the other one is right here, there's a connector on the bottom of the board, which is right there. Luckily it's covered up. We got some bodge wires, we got the scrap marking, and then up here, room for you know two different 40 pin dips. So again, is this somehow similar, maybe like a debugging thing like this one? I don't know, but at least this has a marking here. ISBC 308, let's go look that up. All right, ISBC 308. Okay, single board computer literature. Memory management and protection hardware reference manual. ISBC 308. Unfortunately, these are not clickable links, whatever this website is. Oh, but look at this. Single board computer right there. That, that looks like one of the boards right there that we were looking at. It has the same physical connector. I don't think we had this exact one or maybe I did actually. Well, there are loads of photos here. Look at that, that's the same connector. So right there, okay, so that's SBC 20 slash 200. What about this 81 here? Oh, yeah, look. I don't know how like intercompatible all this stuff is, but uh, let's go up to this 104. I know that, all right. I don't know if they maintain that same um, footprint for the backplane across all these systems. 286. All right, so obviously this was like a test bed or something for Intel. Looks like they kept going here. 3D6, 4D6, is this still using that same connector? It is wild for the 486. All right, so I guess the stuff we have here is just really old. And uh, let's just click through these. Well, let's see if we see anything that looks, uh, okay, that looks totally different. I certainly don't immediately recognize this, although, although, Hmm, this looks a lot like the CPU card though, doesn't it? It just has this, um, yeah, wait, no, I thought that was an add-on board or, or is that, yeah, it is an add-on board, like plugs into that 40 pin dip, maybe adds more RAM, but it's got the ROMs on there. I think this is the one that, uh, that we have one of, there's one of these here and this is called the SBC 8630. Okay, well, 86 makes sense since uh, 8086 for all this stuff, I'm thinking. So I guess these are just various boards. Oh, wait, look at that. There we go. Uh, this one has these gold packages on it and that's not uh, what we have here. We had just like ceramic, I think, but it's missing those ROMs and yeah, fascinating. Well, I wonder if there's documentation around for this stuff or how you would even use this stuff. And my thought is because all of this was scrapped is that none of these boards work, but uh, definitely there's probably people watching this who know a thing or two about this stuff more than I certainly do. And definitely please put a comment down below in the comment section. I'd love to hear more. As for this little board we were just looking at, uh, ISBC 308. ISBC 308, here we go. Is this it? Nope, that is not it. And unfortunately on this page, that is it. There's nothing else on there. I think it was on, on here though. Yeah, ISBC 308 Memory Management Protection Hardware Reference Manual. I, I don't know if it's somehow related to this board or not, but uh, these look like these were all Intel books that do not appear to be downloadable or anything like that. This is not clickable. Definitely kind of neat stuff, but unfortunately, I just don't think there are enough parts here to make a working system because, uh, yeah, I don't have a backplane or anything like that that would go with those bigger cards at least. And I don't know what these plug into. But wait, there's more. Take a look at this wild thing here. So it's got a tag on here, Intel review tag. Let's uh, zoom in here. Plus five to ground short, unable to locate. <laughs> they gave up on this thing. Lot number 1982 is the date that this thing was looked at. Anything on the back? Nope, nothing. So this board is faulty. But look at all the bodges on here, tons of bodge wires and stuff. So yeah, that's gonna be tricky. And some really good engineer, I'm sure, looked at this and was unable to find the fault. So that's not a good sign. Uh, what could this board be? I don't know. It's got these two ZIF sockets on here that are kind of held off the board like that. Looking at the back, got a big red X on it. I'm sure that was after this troubleshooting happened, is unable to locate. Maybe they sprayed this on here 
just to say, do not use this board. It is malfunctioning or whatever. But we also have the scrap marking on there. 163539-001. With these rows of LEDs, lots of bodge wires, no obvious markings on what this is. And then this is a interesting connector. So looks like it's got these locating pins so you can slot this thing in and this helps it align so you don't end up bending these pins. So again, same question to everyone. Do you recognize this? And <laughs> if you do, let me know. Okay, here's the next thing from the box. Network controller card. Okay, so this isn't Intel related at all. This looks like it's for a Mac. Oh yes, it is right here. Asante 1989. So this would probably be for like a Mac SE. Mac Con plus SEE network controller card. Unfortunately, um, I do not have any other parts of this because this right here would be connecting to that little like backplane thing or the part that goes on the back of the Macintosh SE through the opening, allowing you to plug in the ethernet cable. So this is just an ethernet interface, but without that part, it's not particularly useful, unfortunately. All right, now we're getting into some more Mac stuff. This, I guess, is, oh, what's the name of that company that makes Macintosh uh, accelerators and things? And they always have these purple things on them. Video Ready 6100 AV plus for the 7100 and 8100 adapter. And yeah, I forgot the name of the company. I'm just not familiar with the newer Mac stuff. Uh, like this would be for like the PowerPC era of machines. And I guess we got some kind of an IC under there that requires some heat sinking, but I don't know why. I don't know. So the same question applies even to this thing. <laughs> it's like, what is this? Oh, Sonnet, that's it. There it is, Sonnet Crescendo G3. Is this actually like a G3 accelerator for one of those machines? Yeah, I just, um, I don't know too much about these at all. <laughs> and I don't think I have any machines that this would even go in. I, I assume this is for like a PowerPC 604 type machine. Maybe it upgrades it to, G, to G3, I don't know. Uh, and speaking of that, there's this board here. This is for a Macintosh, I guess. Oh, what does it say here? Newer technologies. All right, something top side, newer tech. And yeah, some kind of a processor there. And on the back side, what do we see here? Model Max Power Pro 250 slash 125 newer technologies. So yeah, definitely some kind of a CPU replacement, I guess, for some particular model of Macintosh. If you are familiar with this stuff, let me know what kind of machine this goes in. Uh, maybe I can uh, dig up one of those machines and then give this thing a try, along with uh, this thing here. Okay, moving on. We got some more interesting stuff here. Kind of piled it up on the desk, so let's zoom out a little bit. So this is an oddball item here. Clearly this plugs into a PCI slot, I don't know, on a PC, or a Mac or something like that. Uh, it says PCI Electronic Extender by ASCOM USA. Some kind of bus transceivers here, and it goes from this part of the slot up to here. And then we have a little extra extender stuck in there. And notice they've like bodged on these little pin headers here. So I guess they could read on some signals or something that were kind of coming through. So that's interesting. This is obviously for some type of prototyping. Toggle switch right here. Looks like we have five volts or three volts for the IO voltage. Cuts this for external power, status LEDs, a bunch of voltage regulators. Let's keep going on here. What do we see here? That's a PAL, so like a GAL, but the one-time programmable version. And overcurrent protection here. So maybe this is for development platform and the power that passes through here doesn't just go directly through actually makes its way over to these regulators here, allowing you to configure overcurrent protection to protect your uh, test devices, whatever you're working on, your prototypes. You don't want to accidentally damage them, so you would plug this as an interposer between it and the motherboard. It's the only thing I can think of. Another toggle switch area there, little area here so you can just add your own circuitry and stuff like that. And on the back, nothing much except for some more of these transceivers. I don't really recognize or anything like that. Have you ever used one of these? Have you ever seen one of these? Love to know more about this and uh, 
how was this used? But I'm thinking that PCI card prototyping. Now there's actually two of these. Here's another one of them. Uh, this one, let's see, looks the same on that part, except obviously they're holding the, the adapter or the extender in with these zip ties. Anything else look different? Nah, this all looks the same. So let's look at the back. Nothing different, same, same. Toggle switch. It's kind of cool, these types of prototype things like this. Like, I, you know, there's a lot of engineering that happens around Oregon here. You know, Intel themselves was a bunch of other companies that designed products. Super Mac was here in Portland. Um, I think they were over in Beaverton or Hillsborough or whatever. And all these companies, you know, had weird test jigs like this that they don't need anymore because no one's designing anything for PCI any longer. So therefore, this stuff is just disused. And um, I guess it ends up, you know, at an engineer's house, someone who retired. And then that person is moving to like a retirement home and they don't need to bring all this stuff with them. So it all just sort of goes into the e-waste stream and I end up with some of it. Along the lines of those, look at these things. We have some ISA bus extenders. So you plug this into your ISA motherboard. There's even a normal slot cover here. And then you can plug your card in as well and work on it. Now that's pretty helpful to be honest because uh, sometimes I need to work on cards. Um, look at this, JDR micro devices. Aren't they still around that company? They're still around. Component side, bus extender for the ISA 1986 JDR. And they have actually labeled all of the pins on here. And then there's a bunch of bodging that's been going on here. And I don't know why this, you know, who, who did this and why this was done. But uh, yeah, you can do it because this other one, look at this. <laughs> I mean, what? That's like a little TTL logic chip. And someone's like bodged it in place. And it looks like someone's done previous bodges and they removed them. And this also has this wire here. I mean, the whole thing is just weird. But I guess you just did what you needed to do. They added extra pins here for snooping, I suppose. Doesn't have the uh, slot cover on it. Here's another one. It looks like some pins have been soldered on here. It's not like it's permanently damaged. It can be taken off. Uh, Vector Electric Company in Silmar, California. Odd that these are so similar. Look at this. I guess they're not exactly the same though. So it's just two different things made by two different companies that just happen to do exactly the same thing. And they're, yeah, I don't know. That's funny. This one has the slot cover on it as well with some holes for ports. Oh, look at this. Hilarious. Guess you need to do what you got to do and you set some dip switches. Maybe your uh, card that's under prototype that's plugged in here is like some of the select logic is messed up. So you just bodge this in. Isn't that funny? And there's another one of these. And this one seems unmolested on the front side, at least. All these pins stick out. My assumption is that's on purpose, so you can clip on test leads very easily. That's the only reason why I would think that it's done that way. And on the back, uh, same thing. They're just kind of bent, I think, because this stuff wasn't stored properly. It was all just thrown in the box. And look, these are obviously power leads here, thicker traces. So yeah, kind of cool. Also from Vector. But wait, there's more. We have another PCI-type prototyping thing from Twin Industries. This one has all these headers soldered onto there. Uh, oh, and there you go. You plug your card in this way, and I guess it allows full-on snooping of whatever you need. And then someone added this little header up here, and <laughs> I mean, there you go. And then there's another one of these, but look at this. EISA, Extended Industry Standard Architecture. That's fascinating. This doesn't have those extra long pins that you can clip onto. But ISA bus and EISA, they were intercompatible. Well, you could take an ISA card and plug it into an EISA motherboard because the slot was deeper for EISA and ISA only was on this top row. You notice they ran a trace between the pads. In fact, I'll just grab one of these other cards here. So there it is. They ran traces, thin traces in between uh, there, and then that allowed them to add this lower area here to extend the whole ISA bus to 32 bits with more speed and stuff like that. 
So this is the extender card for uh, for Isa. I mean, it's probably something that's rare because the only people who would ever need one of these were people making prototype Isa cards. Like, how many people were doing that? Not that many. And there's actually more of these because look, here's another one. And this one has these extra wires here. Why? I don't know. And let's flip this over on that side. It's got thicker traces already for power, I suppose. And this bodge wire here. And yeah. And then we have a tag. What does the tag say? Flaky. <laughs> I wonder why it's flaky. Could all this junk here have caused it to be flaky? I don't know. Could also be this was never soldered on properly, this connector up here. I don't know. Anyhow, uh, yeah, it's pretty fascinating. And I just realized we can do a demonstration of the compatibility of ESA and ISA by plugging these into each other. Oh boy, gotta hold this steady. So there we have it, ISA plugged into an ESA slot. Of course, it's not on a real motherboard, but yeah, it does work. And it's interesting because the depth of the connector doesn't really look any different. So it's not like you have to redesign your case if you put an ESA motherboard in there, the cards should just work. Now, if we try to plug the ESA card into the ISA slot, it doesn't work because that notch in the middle is different. See that? That makes it that makes it incompatible. But it is compatible the other way because that notch there, it's kind of like PCI Express. There we go. You can see how it lines up. There's just some extra signals there in the middle of the notch. All right, we have another funky board here. Uh, that's just nothing. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Proto board, wire wrap, pins, very high density looking connector, and a ribbon cable. Got me, you got me what this is, but this could be anything. And we are nearly to the end of the box. There's a couple things in there now. Um, there's a network card here. This is not old. This is a Novell NE2000 network interface. So it's made by Farallon, but it's ISA bus. So obviously this is for the PC. And whenever you have these Novell stickers, I think this would be NE2000 compatible. That means drivers are very easy to come by. And yes, there you go. You can see that's just, uh, and you can see it's just regular 10 base T most likely. And I think it's uh, full duplex, right? Supports full duplex, plug and play. These NE2000 cards are pretty good because there are pretty ubiquitous driver support for them. So you can just stick them in to anything and get up and running really quickly. You don't have to go trying to find this particular drivers for this Farallon card and all that kind of silliness. And the very last thing in here, you may already recognize what this is, even though I haven't zoomed out yet. There it is. It's a Macintosh SE motherboard. We got support for two floppy drives, internal SCSI, external SCSI, external floppy drive. So three floppy drives. It's fully populated with four megs of RAM. The battery's been removed. I mean, these things are very reliable. They don't seem to leak or anything like that. Or I'm sorry, the batteries can leak, but you don't have leaky caps. Mac SE right there. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a Mac SE handy, like a taken apart one. I don't really feel like grabbing one and taking it all apart just to test out another Mac SE motherboard but I will throw this in my two test pile. So next time I have an SE out, I will just quickly give this thing a test. But it looks to be in really nice shape, which is a good thing. And the backside looks totally great as well. And the only thing we just need to see is what kind of disc controller chip is on here. Here it is, the integrated WAS machine. So 344043A. Let's take a look and see what that is. Uh, these are the ROMs right here, but some of these support high density disk drives and some of them don't. There's two different part numbers. All right, here we are on Ancient Tronics. Let's see what it says here about this. So Mac SE, FDHE, that's the version that supports the high density. And here it is right here. So this is the integrated WAS machine and the part number that would be 344-0062 is the super WAS machine or super integrated WAS machine or SWIM, as I think some people call it. I think I called it that. Anyhow, it's good to know that this motherboard is not the type that supports high density. To switch over to one that does, all you gotta do is swap over this chip right here, and I think you have a new ROM set as well. And then you'll actually be able to support the high density disk drives right on the Mac SE motherboard. No other changes are needed. This incidentally is the same chip or a compatible chip 
to what's used in the Apple IIc and cards like the Lyran card, that Apple IIe Super Di or uh, Smart Port Disk Controller card, uses this same floppy drive chip here. So if you have a dead motherboard, like a Mac SE motherboard, and you have a, a, an Apple IIc or a Lyran card potentially that has a non-functional disk drive subsystem because of the bad integrated WAS machine chip, you can steal the one off here. Although I think the one on the 2C doesn't have the A on it, and this has the A, but I'm pretty sure it's all compatible. Not 100% sure, but I'm 99% sure. So there we have it. That was everything in the box. I've got a few Mac things here. I got this purple Sonnet thing and this uh, other thing here, and then this Mac SE motherboard. And we got a whole bunch of these extender things. We had a few of these PCI prototyping cards. There was a Mac SE network card. And then we had all of these cards here, which were like Intel single board computer. Why would it be called the Intel SBC single board computer when clearly this is not a single board? These are all multiple boards. So yeah, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Anyhow, yeah, there we have it. So if you recognize any of this stuff, I could really use some help by uh, you know putting comments down below in the comment section. Tell me what I have here. Obviously the Mac SE motherboard I know about, I don't need to know about that, but, but everything else here, like those Intel single board computers and all this prototyping stuff and these extenders and stuff like that, it's fascinating to me. And it's like a whole world of engineering that I never was part of. So it's always really interesting to hear from people who were in that world and developing hardware using these types of tools or these Intel boards, which I assume was Intel's way of getting people using their computers and their technology. So if you ever worked on one of those, yeah, I'd love to hear about that. So anyhow, uh, that's going to be that. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. That, they really helped me out with all their support. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so. The link in the description below. You get early access to videos and behind the scenes stuff, things like that. And that's going to be that. So yeah, comment down below, subscribe, all the usual YouTube junk. And that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I will see you next time. Bye.